Hello, I'm Rachel Bevin from the Oncology Network, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast. Join Craig Underhill and Hans Prennan as they chat through the latest papers and oncology news. In today's episode, Craig talks us through a Dutch study on neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy in pancreatic cancer. Hans also goes Dutch with a drug paper. In Quick Bites, we look at metastatic colorectal cancer, a vaccine for melanoma, and lung cancer screening among Asian women. We've also analysis of the AACR report on COVID-19 and cancer research, and a blow-your-own-trumpet paper. Next week, we'll hear from Eva Segaloff again with a special episode on the Young Oncology Group of Australia, so listen out for this one. You'll find links to all of the papers, bios, and Twitter handles in the notes on our websites. Visit either oncologynews.com.au or join us on oncologynetwork.com.au. For regular podcast updates, don't forget to subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. We hope you enjoy listening. This is Rachel Bevan and this is the Oncology Podcast. Good day, good day, good day. Welcome (laughs) to all our listeners. (laughs) Why are we laughing, so Craig? It's so weird. Uh, yeah, we do our best to replace Eva. It's not an easy job, but yeah. It's impossible. So yeah, Eva's having a holiday. And so here we are with Hans speaking with his best Australian accent. Giving it a try, yeah. How's everything been since I last saw you? Oh, I think, yeah, same as last week. Not much changed. And how's everything with you, Rachel? People can't see. We put these little names on the on this. We use this platform called Squadcast, so we can see each other, and we have a bit of a smarty competition with who's got the wittiest name. So mine tonight is not as good as Eva, and uh, Rachel's put Eva's stand in. Wish I had the hair for it. So I think you win uh, today's yeah. witty <laughs> name. <laughs> Well, two episodes ago, she did accuse me of having not a very witty name, which just my name. So I thought, as she's not here, I better make extra effort this week. <laughs> so, Craig, what did you choose this week as your main paper? Yeah, I thought you'd like this one, Hans. It's just out in the JCO. It is Dutch, but I think it's okay, is it? You don't. You get on okay with the dust. It's yeah. okay. Neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy versus upfront surgery for resectable and borderline resectable pancreatic cancer, long-term results of the Dutch randomized prea pank trial. So this data has been presented in abstract form in the past, but what was missing was the survival data. So this was a, a large multi-center phase three study, patients with clinically resectable or borderline resectable pancreatic cancer, and they were assigned to either receive upfront surgery or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So that was three cycles of gemcitabine, and cycle two was combined with 36 gray radiotherapy in 15 fractions, so not a huge dose of radiotherapy. After restaging, patients underwent surgery followed by four cycles of adjuvant gemcitabine afterwards. This is the uh, primary outcome was overall survival by intention to treat. So this is the first time we've seen this in publication. So 246 patients, medium follow-up of 59 months, and the overall survival was better in the neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy group with a hazard ratio of 0.73. So statistically significant difference in overall survival was only 1.4 months, 15.7 15.7 versus 14.3. But the five year overall survival rate, and this was interesting, was 20.5% versus 6.5%. So that's quite a big difference. So, and the neoadjuvant chemotherapy was consistent across all the pre specified subgroups, including both the resectable and those considered borderline resectable. So, in the discussion, I point out that there's more trials in progress, including Preopank 2, which was comparing neoadjuvant gemcitabine-based chemoradiotherapy with neoadjuvant fulfurinox, so just chemotherapy alone, 
that's recently completed recruit and should it get results out in 2022. And four more studies with neoadjuvant Fulfurinox, the Norpact 1, Panacho 1, Prodige 48, Alliance AO21806, and Priopank 3. So really interesting. Hans, what was your take on this paper? Well, you know, recently something's changed. We have now a better adjuvant treatment in pancreatic cancer. You know that I'm a huge fan of the neoadjuvant strategy in many tumor types. So here as well. So I think the neoadjuvant will be the future. So I'm a big fan of this trial. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because these patients relapse systemically. They don't relapse locally. So it would make sense that if we're going to make a difference, it's going to be with more effective systemic treatments and getting it to them earlier. Yeah, fully agree. Yeah. So I know that our pancreatic surgeons are, are fans and this started well, several years ago. They were already starting to refer some patients for treatment. I think this will probably convince more and more to be doing this as a standard approach. Yeah, it's the same here. So in the, in the past, is it okay in really – Inoperable locally, inoperable, we start with neoadjuvant and see whether they get a good response. But now the borderline, so even uh, big tumors, they also refer to neoadjuvant therapy. So there is a change ongoing. Yeah. And they're doing ke- just chemo? Are they doing chemo radiotherapy? No chemo. Personally, we're not a big fan of the adding the radi- radiotherapy because, yeah, you know, so many trials were negative in pancreatic cancer. So the radiotherapy still, we don't know what the place is in uh, pancreatic cancer. But as you mentioned correctly, it's a systemic disease. So we should focus on that. Yeah. And so you're using porphyrinox in fit patients? Yes. We give it neoadjuvant, yeah. And in less fit patients wouldn't worry or would you give them gemcitabine or? Yeah, gemcitabine is a, is, is a good auto- alternative. Oh? Gemcitabine plus napaclitaxel, they are all good alternatives because it's a bit of a mistake that they say, okay, you have to give neoadjuvant fulfirinox. If you give gemcitabine plus napaclitaxel or gemcitabine alone, you also have a good effect neoadjuvant. So it's, it's an, also a good alternative. So would you say this is now standard of care? Would you say this is a practice-changing paradigm? I wish it was, but I don't think we have enough data to say worldwide, okay, we should change completely our strategy. But personally, I'm I'm a big fan. So maybe when we have the readout of the Preopank 2 and Preopank 3 and the other new... And the Prodigy studies, yeah. yeah. We'll have enough data to say this is or not. This is uh, what we should do. Okay. So, Hans, what have you got for your main Actually, paper? I also selected a Dutch paper, and it's a, a very interesting one. It's published in Clinical Cancer Research. And why did I select that paper? Because it's the first publication I see about a DRIP trial. Maybe the DRIP trial doesn't ring a bell with you, but uh, here in Belgium, we know it quite well because it's a study from our colleagues in the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam, and DRIP comes from Drug Rediscovery Protocol. And it's a study, why do I like it so much? Because you know that patients with rare cancer, they have less treatment opportunities. So the idea was, let's study these genomically. And when they have an actionable molecular profile, that they are matched to FDA or ema approved targeted therapy or immune therapy. So let's say you have a BRAF mutation, but your thyroid cancer or your small intestine tumor or whatever, we give the MEK inhibition, for example. So they had 25 available drugs, and they included 500 patients, including 164 with a rare cancer. And they started with one of these available drugs. And why am I so jealous? Because I also tried to set up a trial like this in Belgium, but I didn't succeed because you have to have some kind of agreement with all the companies to provide this drug for the study. But what did it show? It showed that there was 33%, so one out of three had benefit. And so this is sometimes something I see in practice as well. And what's the percentage? 33. So were you laughing at my pronunciation? Italian accent, so good. Okay. (laughs) I'm practicing every day with 30, 33. (laughs) Very good. That one almost sounded Irish. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, but the main message, and I think I said it already hundreds of times in this podcast, is it's important to have access to broad molecular testing, and on the other hand, also to have access to the to the drug. Yeah, absolutely, fantastic. What else? You've got a second main paper, I think. Yeah, the second main paper, and it's also something I didn't know, but you have high-grade and low-grade serous ovarian cancer, but I personally don't really treat ovarian cancer. But this is a study, a phase two treat trial in Lancet, February 2022, so a very recent one, in a recurrent low-grade serous ovarian cancer, treated with trametinib. So I was wondering why trametinib? Because apparently these tumors are characterized by MAP kinase pathway aberrations. It's something I didn't know. And they also have a reduced sensitivity to chemo if you compare with the high grade, which is a bit logic because they're slower growing. And 84 hospitals participated in this study across the US and UK. And the main inclusion was that these patients had to be treated with at least one platinum-based regimen and not to not have all five standard of care drugs. So the standard of care drugs, there are Paclitaxel, then Calix, Topotecan, and then some anti-hormonal stuff like Letrozole, Tamoxifen. So the idea was you should not have received them all because one arm got, they were randomized, and then one arm got the trametinib, and the other arm, you could get your physician's choice, whatever you didn't give yet. So either anti-hormonal or Paclitaxel or whatever. And they included 260 patients. It's randomized. And the PFS was 13 versus 7.2 months, so almost double. So I think trametinib should be a new standard of care in these in this patients with low-grade serous ovarian cancer. Yeah. So in episode 62, you also presented a gynae cancer patient paper, Hans, and even made the comment, you know, these are all... Ovarian cancer is not all the same, is it? And so there's different histology, but there must be different molecular drivers. And I just wonder, just as I was listening to you giving that brilliant presentation, that maybe this is going to go down the path like lung cancer. We're going to be doing more molecular testing of ovarian cancers and finding the drivers and targeting the tumours in that way. I'm just thinking a bit out of left. I think I, I fully agree. I think it's more and more in, in different tumor types that you, sh- you see this evolution. For example, I didn't know that the MAP kinase pathway were specifically active in these uh, tumors. So don't ask me questions like whether there are mutations in this pathway. I don't know. It's just overexpression or whatever. But it's, it's something very interesting. And maybe we should interview a specialist in this field in the near future for our podcast. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, you know, although these people do better than, say, pancreas cancer or lung cancer in general, there's still the five-year survival rates are still poor. And so we still need to be doing better. And we've obviously, you know, hit the glass ceiling of chemo. And so surely there's going to be more advances to come with some targeted therapies. Fully agree. So do you also have an, another main paper, Craig, or you have your short bites now? No, I've got quite a few short bites, Hans. We've got a few GI papers, but you'll hopefully enjoy them. And one was Solstice 3. It's a negative study. So it's trifluoridine, tipracil plus bevacizumab versus capecitabine bevacizumab from the Solstice 3 trial presented at ESMO virtual plenary session. So both arms had a median progression-free survival of just over nine months, but there was no difference in the median um, progression-free survival. So, you know, it was touted as a potential treatment option, but looks to be no difference between the two. So it didn't seem to be much difference in the toxicity, although the trifluoridine tipracil patients had a much higher rate of neutropenia and avoided the hand-foot syndrome that we see with Cape Cytopene. So your thoughts on that one, Hans? Well, I fully agree with with the conclusions there. So these are not super interesting things eh, because you're just uh, using drugs in different uh, ways, et cetera. But I like more all the new agents, new combinations. This is for me the most interesting part. And then one that caught my eye from the ASCO GI Symposium, and 
we've just had listed in Australia in carifenib with cetuximab for patients with BRAF mutated uh, metastatic colon cancer. And this was a study in MSI stable BRAF V600 mutated metastatic colon cancer phase one, two trial combining incarafenib, cetuximab and nivolumab. So point about this MSI stable population is, of course, we don't normally see any real activity in that group. It's funny, Craig, that some people say MSI stable because MSI is microsatellite instable, huh? so microsatellite instability. So you say microsatellite instability stable. So I would rather say MSS, so microsatellite stable patients. Okay. Thanks, Professor. But, just, um, just to clarify. So, so stable patients with BRAF mutated tumors. And so, you know, in a phase one, two study, they saw response rates of 50%, de- disease control 96%, median follow-up 16.3 months, progression-free survival 7.4 months, overall survival 15 months, response duration 7.7 months. So promising activity, but obviously there'll need to be more studies, in particular phase three studies. But what are your thoughts? This is coming back to our previous discussion in the last episode about combining targeted therapy with the checkpoint inhibitors, so interesting activity in this group as well. Yeah, but also importantly, as you mentioned correctly, they're not only looking in the MSI patients. So now we look also for immune therapy in the MSS because we know that some respond and maybe with the help of combinations, you can get them response. And I actually also have one short bite about this topic, but I will let you finish first. Oh, now why don't you do yours? What I wanted to to show is just, uh, it's a study that is just ongoing, uh, but you know, sometimes they publish papers about ongoing studies without results. And this uh, caught my my eye because it's a study about pembrolizumab with Kpox bevacizumab, so standard chemo plus bevacizumab, and then adding pembrolizumab in MSS, metastatic colon cancer, with a high immune infiltrate because it's a French study. And we know that, let's say, around 15% of MSS colons have a high immune infiltration, although they're MSS. And we know that Oxali and we, we, we told it uh, very recently, Bevacizumab have immunomodulatory properties. So his trial is called the POCHI trial. I don't know if I pronounced it right. And they plan to enroll 55 patients. And the first patient was already included in April 2021. So I'm looking really forward to the results of uh, this study in first line. Yeah, great. All right, so I'm going to switch track and we've got a short bite on this time melanoma. So again, the phase one, two study like the last quick bite. is This is a phase one, two study of an immune modulatory vaccine against IDO PDL one in combination with nivolumab in metastatic melanoma. So of course, melanoma has become sort of the poster child, hasn't it, a new immunotherapy development. So this was uh, the first-in-class vaccine against indolamine 2,3-deoxygenase de- de- deoxygenase and PD-L1 um, in combination with nivolumab, 30 therapy-naive patients with metastatic melanoma in this phase 1-2. Objective response rate 80%, 43% complete responses, after 22 months of progression f- follow-up, the progression-free survival was 26 months. Overall survival not reached. And so, you know, impressive activity. And obviously there'll be more trials to come. But we talked in episode 62 about lag three in combination with combination with the volume app with some impressive activity. And so this is first in class vaccine against IDO. So in other words, this is a dual therapy against a dual therapy immunotherapy and perhaps going to avoid some of the side effects that we see with the ipinevo combination with a high rate of face of state of grade three and four toxicity. But as I said, it remains to be seen bigger studies, how that really pans out. But good on the melanoma doctors again leading from the front in this interesting new field. 
Yeah, luckily we have Georgina Long explaining us how we place which uh, therapy in which line. Exactly. And that was um, from, again, your favorite journal, Hans Nature Medicine. So I recommend you have a look at that. And then my last quick bite, just to point out an interesting report, I like to do this. It's an AACR report on the impact of COVID-19 on cancer research and patient care. So it's a, a very long report, 100 pages. But one of the highlights for me, they discuss this concept of decentralized clinical trials. So in Australia, we use the term teletrials, referencing the use of telehealth to conduct clinical trials. And so this paper includes a section documenting the impact of the pandemic on the conduct of clinical trials, the uptake of the use of telehealth to conduct trials. And in North America, they're using this term decentralized clinical trials, referring to the fact that we're putting patients more at the center and taking services out to them using telehealth, enabling them to use telehealth for consultations, shipping the drug to the patient or to a remote center, allowing patients to have blood tests done at remote centers uh, rather than asking them to come into the institution to, to do it, which is sort of the traditional paradigm. So for those of you who are involved in conduct of clinical trials, and let's face it, that's most people, if not all, uh, in the field of oncology, an interesting paper about the impact of the pandemic. Really cool. Their hearts has fallen asleep. <laughs> but I still have one short bite, Craig. Good, go for it. And as you discuss more GI, I decided to discuss a bit more lung. Uh, so uh, it's actually about uh, CT screening in lung cancer patients. And this is one in Asian women in, in Taiwan. And because there's a more and more discussion, okay, we say, okay, we have to screen more. But then, yeah, in some countries at least, luckily the amount of smoking is going sometimes also down. So whether we should screen in non-smoking patients is not so clear. So this is a paper published in JAMA Internal Medicine, January 2022. And the objective was to study what of the study was to de de determine the association of lung cancer incidence with the promotion of screening in a very large non-smoking population. And actually, to, to summarize, the study showed that there was a really overdiagnosis. So the conclusion was that maybe screening should remain targeted only to heavy smokers. But I don't know, Craig, what's your opinion about this? Well, yeah, it's interesting. So why just women? What was the rationale for Ex that? Um, is this because of the yeah. non-smoking women who are getting getting lung cancers that often have actionable targets? Yeah, maybe. Maybe that was the reason. I don't know. And often they, you know, they present with late stage disease. They can have brain metastases, widespread mets, big disease burden. So, you know, there's some accumulating evidence that screening for at-risk patients is beneficial in lung cancer and some programs have been piloted and being tested around the world for screening, more particular in smokers or ex-smokers. So this is a, you know, interesting paper for those practicing in the field of lung cancer. Do they do screening for lung cancer in Belgium, Hans? No, I don't, sort of I don't think we do routinely, no. Right. We're about to kick off some pilots in Australia. Okay. Now, Hans, last but not least, we've got my favourite new segment, first featured on episode 62, and this is the Blow Your Own Trumpet Paper of the Week. Actually, I have a very interesting one, and I, I advise you all to read it. It's a collaboration I did with Italian colleagues, it's published in Ember Reports the, at the end of February 2022. And it's called Iron Supplementation is Sufficient to Rescue Skeletal Muscle Mass and Function in Cancer Cachexia. So why is it so cool, this study? Because um, I'm a big fan of iron, at least iron intravenously, because as you know, oral iron is usually not being uptaken by cancer patients. Iron. 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 No, no R, iron. Why iron? You know, you, know, you know how in French, you know in French, the yes. H is silent. It's the same. It's iron. And it's probably best 
like talk, say it in your nose. Iron. 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 Oh, no, iron. Close your mouth. <laughs> iron. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so why is it important? Yeah. Y- yes, Greg? So why is it so cool, this paper? Why is it cool? Because you should have seen the pictures of the mice experiments that we did and because uh, we created some kind of mice model where you have mice that have cachexia and that are very weak. And when you touch them, they don't move. And then you give them iron. And uh, once you give it to them, they become very active. And we checked this in patients uh, that had deficiency and we gave them intravenous iron. And we had this strength test. So they had to squeeze. Uh, This is an official test. And you saw in, in, in two weeks that the strength improved really a lot. Well, of course, a lot of questions, how long does this improve in strength? But I think there should be done more research about this, about the use of, of iron in uh, cancer patients, especially the ones, for example, lung cancer, about 50% has a lack of iron. I don't know if you knew this. Really? No, I didn't know that. So they have, they have a, a low serum iron and high ferritin you should not look at have... this you know it's a good question so you should only look at the transient saturation so the saturation is the only important one that you have to look at because serum iron is fluctual depending on what you eat and the ferritin is an acute phase uh, protein so in all inflamed status it's increased so if your transfer saturation is below 20 percent, it means you have some kind of deficiency often a functional one and in these patients, you should treat them with intravenous iron because these days you can give 1,000 milligrams in, let's say, 15 minutes. So you don't have to, it's not a big deal. And uh, it helps, yeah, of course, in improving the red blood cells, but also yeah, quality of life, strength, feel good. It's a really amazing paper. So it's a validated tool, you said, the grip strength? Yeah, this grip strength is used as a validated tool, yeah, yeah. So where to next? Are you going to do some more studies in patients? Uh, This study took so long, four or five years, and the problem is that we only have one pharmaceutical company in in Belgium that produces this. So there's not even competition between companies, and I don't know if there's a big drive for companies to do trials in this. So maybe it's something we have to set up um, academically. So let me know, and maybe we have to discuss with Eva if she's interested to set something up in this field. Those poor mice. No more mice experiments, please. No, this so time it's in humans. The mice was the preclinical part. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can't go without you getting this correct, getting your English right. It's iron. Can you say that? Iron. That's, well, perfect. <laughs> All right. So we're missing you, Eva, and hope you're having a great break. And I think that's about it. For this week's episode, I know you've got to rush off to do a clinic, Han. So yep. have a good day. Have a good week. Okay. Thank you, Craig. And my pleasure. Thanks to all the listeners for your support. It's been great. We look forward to having Eva back. And so, Rachel, thank you very much as well. Oh, always a pleasure, Craig. Thank you. And thanks to you, Hans, as yep. well. Thank you all. And see you, all. you soon. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Take care. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.